In this video, we're going to take an overview look at Kotlin scope functions, let, apply, run, with, and also. Now, why do we have scope functions and what are they? Well, first remember what a block is. A block is a unit of code that's contained within an open curly and ends with a closed curly. Within that block, any variable declared has scope. In other words, it's alive within that block, but then it gets cleaned up once that block is finished. So in Kotlin, they've used this idea of scope to save us a lot of typing. We can put an object into kind of a convenient place in memory for a limited scope, and that's what these scope functions do. So they save us typing because we can access an object without its name, we can access an object without assigning it to a variable first, and then we can refer to that object either with the lambda variable it or with a variable this. More on that to come in just a moment. But the reason why a lot of people like Kotlin is that you can do a whole lot with a lot less typing. And these scope functions are key to that. So let's consider what I mean by this with an example. This is a simple example of how you can use a scope function. And if you're kind of looking for something where you want to pin your knowledge, this is a good place to refer back to. So if you're a traditional Java programmer, or maybe you, you have used Kotlin without the scope functions, you might recognize what we have on the left. We're declaring a variable called plant with a lowercase p of type plant with an uppercase p. And then immediately after that, we assign values to the genus, species, and common attributes on this plant variable. You notice each time we refer to genus, species, and common, or any of the attributes of this plant variable, we have to use it as what we would call an implicit parameter. Or in other words, we use the variable and then a period and then the attribute that we want to access. If we're doing this many, many times, that feels like a lot of redundant typing. So with the scope functions, we can do something like this. Notice we have the scope function with, and then inside of that we are passing a value which happens to be a new plant object, just like we have on the left. Now we have our block, which is the open curly and closed curly, as I mentioned earlier. And this plant object essentially has scope within this block. In other words, it is the primary object we are operating on within this block. So when you see genus equals acer, species equals ruber, uh, common equals red, each time we're operating on this plant object, even if this with block is inside of another class or inside of another object. These two on the left and right essentially are the same thing. But you see, if we have a whole lot of things that we want to do to this plant object, using the scope function on the right will save us a whole lot of typing. One consideration with scope functions is there are several different options on how you use the scope function. For example, how do you take in the parameter that you're operating with? Is it going to be an it or is it going to be a this? When you're all finished with the scope function, what do you return? Do you return the object you're operating on or do you return a lambda result? And then finally, is it, is it an extension or non-extension function? Non-extension means that you have to pass the object in as a parameter, essentially. Extension means that it's just a, a function that operates on an object that already exists or a class type that already exists. Now, we've started our discussion by using this as kind of a framework or a starting point. So let's take a look at with again and consider the options that we get with with. First of all, we refer to the context object through the this variable. This is a keyword for whatever object we are currently in. So if we're in a class, this would refer to an object that was instantiated from that class. It's just a shortcut to say our current object. But with the scope function, it's kind of neat because we can change the definition of this. We can say, okay, within, the, within this block, this is going to refer to something else. We also have return as lambda result, which means in a typical lambda, the last line to execute is the return statement. And also with is a non-extension function, which means we have to pass in the object. Let's go back and take a look at what we mean by that. Non-extension, you see that we're passing the object in kind of as a parameter uh, into this with scope function. Now you notice the genus species in common, we don't have, we're not calling this with reference to an object. So by the default, when we're not calling something with reference to an object, we assume that we're using the keyword this. And then as a lambda, the last line to execute is what's going to return. But in this case, we're not concerned about the return because you see, we're not actually assigning this to something. So that's with. Now let's compare that to a similar one, run. 
Run is very similar to with. The only difference is that it is an extension function, which means that we don't have to pass the object in. Instead, we use the object and then say dot run and then have an open curly and close curly. Just a little subtle difference on that one. Okay, so let's take a look at let. Let is very similar to with, where it returns the re lambda result, just like with and run do. The difference is that the object passed in is going to be referred to by the lambda variable it, and not by the this variable. Now with the this variable, we know that we don't have to say this dot do something each time. We can just say do something, and it assumes that it's running on the this variable. Not so with it. With the it variable, uh, we do have to explicitly state that each time. So take a look at uh, the difference between this and it. Very similar, we have plant.apply, where apply is one of our options that uses this variable. And then we also have a plant uh, plant.let, where plant uses the it variable. So you notice with apply, we can just say genus equals acer, species equal rubra, common equals red maple, and it knows that it's operating on this plant object we've declared up here because that's essentially in the this keyword. On the other hand, let doesn't use this, it uses it. So when we have it, it still refers to this plant object here, but we have to explicitly state it each time we want to refer to that object. So which one do you want to use? Well, it really depends. If you're always doing operations on the same object, uh, this makes sense. But on the other hand, if you're using this context object and doing other things, it might be a little more declarative to use it so you can tell what you're working on at the time. Okay, so also is very similar to let, but the difference with also is the return type. So you see with let and run, the ones that we've spoken about so far, the return type is the lambda result, or in other words, the last line to run in the lambda. But with uh, also, and with apply, the return type is the context object. Now, what does that mean? The context object is the object that we're passing into this scoped function. So by the return type being the context object, it means we're going to receive this context object, we're going to perform some operations on it, then we're going to return it, which gives us the opportunity to chain things together. So let's take a look at another example, you see here we have a plant object and we're using apply, and we're doing some operations on this plant object. Then when we're done, it's going to return that plant object, and we run yet another apply on it, and we do some other operation on it. So when we're returning the context object, instead of returning the lambda result, we have the option to kind of daisy chain things together and do a whole bunch of operations at once. Okay, uh, the only difference between also and apply then is are we using the it variable or are we using the this variable? Now we know we can omit the this variable if we're using a scope function that uses this, but you don't have to. So you can see, see here on the left, I have an apply where I have omitted the this variable. On the right side, I have the same apply where I've included the this variable. That's up to you whether you want to include it or not, whether you think that that extra typing is worthwhile for the documentation, or you prefer to go without the extra typing. But remember, if you're using IT, you do have to, to have to explicitly state that every time. Okay, so what if it is a lambda result then? What do we do in that case? Well, we know that the last line to run is what's going to be returned. So we can do a little trick like this. We have our plant object, and then we're invoking the run scoped function on it. We populate the genus, species, and common attributes of this plant object with Circus, Canadensis, and Eastern Redbud. But you notice that the last thing to run here is the toString function. Now, once again, we know it's running on this plant object because run, if we go back to our table, run uses that object as a this, so we don't have to explicitly state it, and the return from the run is the lambda result. So back to our example here, Plant.genus equals Circus, plant.species equals Canadensis, plant.common equals Eastern Redbud, and then plant.toString. And we're assuming here that plant.toString is maybe going to assemble all of these together into one consolidated string. And now take a look, because the result or the return value from a lambda expression is the last line to run, what we can do is we can add our assignment operator right before this scoped function, and we can assign 
the return from the scoped function to a variable. And that's what we have going on here. Now, let's look a little deeper at also while we're talking about these scope functions. And if you look at the definition of also on Kotlin, it, it kind of leaves a bit to be desired if you're not, if you're not familiar with the syntax. It says inline fun t, t also block t, arrow unit t. And that can kind of cause your head to spin if you're not quite sure what's going on here. First of all, let's look at this t dot also. That's the context object that we keep speaking about. That's the thing that is in scope within this block. Now also we said is an extension function, and that's something that's unique to Kotlin. In Kotlin, an extension function means you can add a function to a class that already exists. That's something we couldn't do, at least couldn't do easily in Java, but in Kotlin it's possible. So in other words, you could take the string class and add a function that capitalizes everything. That's what's going on here. We're saying take this object and just add this function after the fact. Now within here, we see a typical Lambda syntax where we're accepting a parameter and we're having it do some work. And here we're saying the work is just going to be some kind of work. Notice that what we're accepting here is the same type as the context object that we're calling the scope function on. And that's on purpose because that's the whole point of a scope function. We're taking this context object, we're calling this also function on it, and then we are taking the context object and passing it in as a parameter to this also block. And because it's only one parameter, we can use that it, uh, that it syntax if we want to. Now, you see that it's also returning that context object. So let's go back up and look at also, and we see also, okay, we can pass in a parameter and use it as an it, and then it returns the context object. So in a little more symbology than I used, that's what this line is saying. And I've kind of called it out in a few definitions here, so you can pause the video if you wish and take a closer look at this and kind of think about it just a little bit. Frankly, when I put together this presentation, this slide I did have to pay a little bit of attention to just because I kind of had to unwind it in my own head so I could explain it to you. I hope I did a good job. Now, uh, let's also remember how lambdas work and how this it works. First, let's quickly remember what a lambda is from a previous presentation I did. I talked about the differences between a Java uh, method and a Kotlin function, how we move a few things around here, and essentially from a Java method we get to a function. Now we take this function and we see that we still have a lot of typing and we know we can do a little bit more rearranging of this function and essentially turn it into a one-line lambda, uh, or more lines if we want, but nonetheless we can turn it into a one-line lambda and we can assign it to a variable. In this case we've taken our parameter, we put it on the left side of this arrow, and then we know we can use it on the right side of this arrow, which is where we're going to do our work. Now in this case we only have one incoming parameter, it's called factor, and it's of type int. If that's the case then we get to shortcut things a little bit, and we can take out that entire parameter, and we can also take out a couple other things that can be inferred. Uh, if we only have one parameter, we can take out this part to the left of the arrow, and we just know that the parameter passed in is going to be in a variable called it. So it removes a bit of typing. We simply have to change our reference on the right to it because that's the default single parameter name. And then once we do that, we can get rid of all of this stuff on the left, and our lambda becomes much simpler, much more consolidated. That same rule applies to these scoped functions that use the it operator. You see, we, we don't have to use that default it. We could go ahead and declare it and say first name and then goes to foo first name like so. Or we could go ahead and chop off that declaration over here and just refer to it as it. So that's kind of your own choice. Do you want to go with the default it or do you want to give the parameter a name? The times I give the parameter an explicit name are when we have multiple alsos that are chained together. You see here in this example we have an also on one object, an also on another object, and then an also on yet another object. All of these are nested. Think twice about that. Do you really want to do that deep kind of nesting because it does get a little bit hard to read? Well just be careful. But if you take a look up at the very first also, 
you see that we are explicitly declaring the parameter name take picture intent and you'll see that take picture picture intent is referenced several times in the block that follows now the second also we actually don't do anything with the iteration variable but the third also we do and you see down here we're referring to the to the lambda implicit parameter or the iteration variable as it which is different from the variable up here the reason I point this out is you see that we have the lambda variable here for this also but within that same also block we have the lambda variable that was declared for another also so my rule of thumb is you should explicitly declare the variable name if you have nested blocks nested scope function blocks or you anticipate that you will at some point otherwise if it's just a quick and dirty safe to go ahead and use the it so that is a look at scoped functions in kotlin i hope this video has been helpful and i look forward to reading your comments thank you